If you read uh, How to Buy a Love of Reading, you'll notice there's lots of F. Scott Fitzgerald quotes, actually, in the book, and it's set on Long Island, just as The Great Gatsby was. So what's up with F. Scott Fitzgerald, anyway? <laughs> well, when I first read The Great Gatsby, which must have been in high school, I really, really didn't get it at all. Um, and I grew up on Long Island, but on the South Shore, which is about at a completely different planet away from the North Shore. Um, where The Great Gatsby takes place. Um, it's just very, very, very different socioeconomically, among other things. Um, so it didn't have any resonance for me, and then when I read it in college, it also had no resonance for me whatsoever. Um, and I just didn't get Fitzgerald. And then I became a high school English teacher, and um, I had to teach The Great Gatsby. <laughs> and um, I'm sitting there with a bunch of 11th graders, and one of the girls goes, so why is Daisy such a biatch? And I was like, that's a really good question. Um, and I kind of reread it from this very emotional standpoint about like, well, why do these people act the way they do? And I got Fitzgerald for the first time, and I had to have been like 30 years old, and I'm suddenly getting Fitzgerald. Um, and I fell in love with the book. It's sometimes like, you know, the things you hate the most, you end up loving the most, and I end up falling in love with it. Um, I ended up setting my novel on the North Shore of Long Island because I ended up returning to Long Island and teaching on the North Shore um, in this community of, of mansions and old and new money. Um, and when I started the book, which um, was pretty much right after I left there, I actually had missed the area. And I was out here in Northern California and there could almost be nothing further away than the North Shore of Long Island and I was kind of trying to relive it. Um, and Fitzgerald just kept finding, I guess because I connected them in my head, he, I just kept on finding him coming in. And then I made him the idol of um, Carly's love interest, Hunter, um, who was in the scene I read. And because Hunter is an alcoholic, um, I realized that I could just go further and further with it because um, I find Fitzgerald fascinating, his bio fascinating um, in that almost like lifetime movie of the week kind of tragic way. And um, so I thought that I could just keep on kind of rolling him and his life into it for this poor character who is about to take the same really bad path. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Was it hard to cast yourself into the mind of Carly, the teenage girl? Unfortunately not. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. that I have a twofold answer to that. And the first is that I discovered sometime in my late 30s that the person I really was is the same person I was when I was about 14 years old, and that I had probably spent about 20 intervening years trying to be somebody who I actually was not, that I'm actually like this quirky. And, um, and this really kind of strange. I have a very strange view of what, for instance, is, is beautiful. I'm reminded of this a lot by my psychiatrist husband when I'll say, I don't get why so-and-so gave me a funny look. And he, she'll, he'll say, because you think weird and you are strange. And I love you, but you're strange. Um, I, I feel like by the time I started writing this book, I kind of realized that I still am the person I was when I was 14, that the same things that wounded me in middle school will continue to wound me now and perhaps always will. And that while that is not perhaps um, a, testimony, a testament to my maturity, um, it is at least true and that I, I, I kind of accept that about me. And I channeled a lot of that into, into Carly. Um, the other part of that answer is that when I started writing the book, the uh, main character, I thought, was this woman, um, this writer who Carly's very wealthy family hires to come write a book for her. Because Carly, who is 16, has never read a book she likes. And they want to buy her intellectualism, so they say, we're gonna, we're gonna hire you this woman and give her $25,000 to write a book that you will fall in love with. So I thought that my main character was this woman, Brie. You know, I was gonna be able to relate to her, right? Because she was like me, right? Didn't have a lot of money, trying to do a job on North Shore Long Island, being mistreated by rich people. Even though I wasn't mistreated, I could imagine that one could be if one was being paid in that manner. And it turned out that I hated her, like a lot. She was the worst protagonist ever. She was an interesting character, but a very poor protagonist because you don't really want to hang out with her and have a lot of quality time with her. And 
the person who was supposed to be the antagonist, the 16-year-old who was kind of bratty, she was really funny. Everybody who read the stuff was like, we like her. And so she became the protagonist, and um, I, I like to think that I funnel some of the good part of my 14-year-old self, self through her. You've sort of answered this in the last question, but just stepping back, what spurred that idea in the first place? Very intriguing of buying a love of reading. It seems one of those, you, you're born with it or you whatever. So what spurred that idea? I, when I was teaching on the North Shore of Long Island, I was a new teacher, so I was late 20s, and um, all full of vim and vigor, and I loved books, because I was that kid, you know, who was reading since I was three to escape, like, the outside world that didn't really get my weirdness. So I forgot that not everybody does, um, and I'm teaching at this private school on the North Shore of Long Island, and this one child who was so well-behaved, ninth grader, sweet, gentle, nice girl, but she was just checked out every conversation we had. And so I finally said to her, hey, you know, like, I'll put something on the syllabus that you would like or give you extra credit. Like, just tell me, what do you like to read? Because, you know, you, you need to not fail English, among other things. And she said, it's not your fault, Ms. Egan. I've never read a book I liked. And I thought that was really strange. And I did like what, what newbie teachers do. And I blame TV. I was like, you watch too much TV, right? She doesn't watch TV. I'm like... It's the pot. You smoke too much pot, don't you? <laughs> she was like, no, I don't actually do very much partying. And I'm like, well, what do you do? I'm trying to imagine like how one fills this large void. And she says she goes out with her friends and does normal ninth grade things, or ninth grade on the North Shore Long Island things. And um, then she would come home and relive her day in her head, and she would play the whole thing back like a video. And then she would get to the parts that didn't go the way she wanted them to, and she would change them. Now, I get that, because I come back from every social occasion I ever go to, going, I can't believe I fucking said that. <laughs> I was on stage, and I said that, and it was being recorded, and I said the F word. This is what I should have said instead. This is my meta moment. Um, so I, I'm, I was like, I get that. That's kind of a cool thing. I do that. But like, she spent, like, makes a hobby out of it. And I kind of forgot about a lot of that until I started, at some point, trying to write this, this book about, you know, being on the North Shore of Long Island. And I remembered that about her. And I said, you know, I want my main character to do that. I want her to be somebody who actually is a natural storyteller, who tells things in her head and retells them. And everyone thinks that she's an idiot, but she actually knows exactly what makes a good story because, you know, Fitzgerald would say that, you know, it's the things that embarrass us most that actually end up making a good story. Bad paraphrase, but good sentiment. Thank you. And what's next on the literary horizon? Oh, my. Um, <laughs> I, I'm writing a book that's set in an amusement park. It's a fictional theme park called Mertopia. Uh, the the uh, theme park. The book's called Lands, L-A-N-D-S, and um, it's about a figure skater who has had a career-ending injury who ends up skating in an ice show um, dressed in a full-body jellyfish costume um, at this theme park. And um, she starts to suspect that the magic that everyone talks about in the theme park may be not just metaphorical, magic, but that there's something way bigger going on there than just uh, roller coasters and dark rides. So any questions for Tanya? I keep looking at you like you're going to have brilliant... Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yes. So any... Okay. Thank you very much, Tanya. Appreciate it. Yeah.